Finally, finally, Yancy Strickler is here, the co-founder of Kickstarter. It's a company I've been wanting to have on the program for a very long time. We're live from New York at the offices of Belgrave Trust. Thank you to them. It's going to be an amazing episode. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Everybody and thank you for joining us. We're live from New York for this week in startups. Thanks, thank to, thanks to Belgrave Trust. If you don't know who they are, they're an amazing company here in New York that is doing uh, really cool products that offset your carbon. Here's an example. It's a sticker you can buy for ten bucks, and if you put it on your laptop, it looks super sexy like that. Hard to see, but um, makes your Apple logo look really cool, and uh, you don't have to worry about destroying the planet. Your carbon offset for ten bucks for a sticker. Thank you to Belgrave Trust for hosting us. Uh, and thanks to all the executive producers for helping make the program better. 75 people have joined. We're crowdsourcing the production of the show. If you're interested in joining the list and being part of the back channel, go to twistlist.co. And thank you to our uh, wonderful, wonderful sponsor, Squarespace. They're right here in New York. And uh, we build the launch site on Squarespace. I build all my sites on Squarespace. It's a wonderful New York company. Uh, if you want to go give Squarespace a try, go to squarespace.com slash twist, T-W-I-S-T and you'll get a 14-day free trial. Use the, the code TWI30 to receive 30% off for three months. If you go sign up and send your receipt to contests at This Week in Startups, or This Week in, contests at This Week in, we will send you one of the beautiful uh, This Week in Startups bags. Um, and thank you to them. It's just an amazing piece of software. Again, we only accept partners and sponsors on the show for products that I use or consume. So there's a sort of a white list of 100 people that we'd even take advertising from. And Squarespace is right at the top of the list as one of my most loved products. You can't make independent media like this without the support of the audience. And actually, at the core of what Kickstarter is, is independent. It's, it's support for independent projects, isn't it? It is. Yeah, um, So Kickstarter is this amazing company I've been fascinated with. I've been trying to get you guys on the program for a better part of a year. You finally made it. I really do appreciate it. Welcome to the program. Tell uh, our audience, what is the mission of Kickstarter? Uh, sure. Why did you create it? Sure. Well, uh, Kickstarter is a funding platform for creative projects. So it's a way for people to make whatever sort of things they want. It, it ranges from films to records to photography to art to technology to food, design, comics, anything that springs from the imagination. Um, and basically, it's a way for people to, to take the idea that they have, the project they want to make, put it to their audience and to the internet at large and, and ask them to help be a part of it and to help fund its creation. Hmm. Um, so typically a word you'd hear it around this is, is crowdfunding or something like that to talk about this sure. idea. But it's basically enabling anyone to take their ideas uh, you know, directly to the public without those intermediators, whether they're banks or record labels or right. grant applications, those sorts of things that, that tie people in knots when they're trying to do things. And it seems like the first wave of these were people trying to make records, am I correct? Yeah, that? well, it, you know, it started from uh, sort of a creative space. Um, mm -hmm. The history of the company is that uh, in 2002, my co-founder, Perry Chen, who's also yep. our CEO, um, had this idea while living in New Orleans, and he was trying to put on a concert but lacked the money to do it. And so he thought, if only there was some way where I could set a threshold and enough people acted to meet that threshold and yeah. the show would happen. If it didn't, it wouldn't happen. So some sort of demand threshold. Yeah, right? something like that. So he had that idea in 2002, and then he and I met uh, in 2005. You were a music journalist at the time? I was working as a music journalist, and he was a waiter, and he was my waiter wow. at a restaurant in Brooklyn called, no. uh, called Diner. And, uh, I was yeah, a, I know it. I was a regular there. And That's Williamsburg, I think. It's in Williamsburg. Yeah. I was a regular. I think that was, was the first restaurant in Williamsburg. It really was. It opened in 98. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of the start of New Brooklyn. So now, wait, you said you were employed as a music journalist. I thought that music journalism meant you didn't get paid. I mean, uh, who were you writing this for? Is, this is true. Yeah. Uh, my, my day job was with eMusic. I also worked for Flavor Pill, if you know sure, that. Sure, of course. Uh, and then I was a freelancer for Pitchfork and The Village Voice. Oh, and so New you York were magazine. In, amongst the cream of the uh, music but not very, prop. But not very good. Just, not very just good? Just a guy with a memorable name. Ah, got uh, it. And uh, but you so are, we, you're, 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 he's your waiter. He was my waiter. And we, we became buddies because I went there a fair amount. And then he pitched me this idea. 
And uh, he pitched you the music writer of the idea. Yeah. Well, I because I worked on the internet, so I knew oh. more about the internet than he did. What um, year is this? This is 2005. 2005. Yeah. Wow. And so he shared this idea, and I liked it, and we started brainstorming about it. Um, but he was a waiter, and I was a rock critic, so we were not the ideal team to start something sure. like this. I mean, who would fund a team made up yes. of those two pedigrees? The answer is not many people. Not uh, many? <laughs> yeah, not many. So what, in 2005, did you start trying to actually make this happen? We did. We did. And we could only get so far. And about uh, a year later, we met our third founder, Charles Adler, who mm -hmm. uh, was a design guy, yep. creative director. He had been at agency.com. We met of him course. through a mutual friend. Web 1.0 company, Chan Su. And exactly. Kyle Shannon. So he helped us take these ideas that we had and translate them into more of a website. But still, we didn't have the technical team. And did you have the name Kickstarter then? Or uh, at that point, what at that point, it, it was earlier? called Critical Mass. Yeah. And then it, and then it, we realized that was very taken by a million other things. Yeah. Um, a bicycle name, ride at Burning Man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so then Where we people ride with their tops off. We came, we came up with Kickstarter yeah. eventually, and uh, and so from that point, we were really working in, in earnest on it for a while, but we didn't have the tech team to do it, and we didn't uh, have much at all. We were just, you know, a couple guys with a weird idea. So what do you mean, just putting up web pages, like HTML, static pages? Nothing, nothing. We couldn't, yeah. we couldn't get anything built. Um, wow. It, so you're two or three years into this idea, and you've got nothing. And we've got nothing, and it was challenging. We had, we'd raised a little bit of money from some friends and family, um, basically the people who were willing to give us money. Interestingly, we're all people who were artists. So our very first investor was the comedian David Cross, who was in sure. Arrested Development, Mr. Show, all of these course, things. Of course, yeah. So he liked the idea. Uh, the publisher of Pitchfork was an investor. A couple guys in bands that we liked invested. We were wow. just so you randomly crowdsourced pitching. the funding of we the really company. We really did. We really did. And had no success. Uh, well, we had six. Eventually, there was success. Back, what was the first success? Um, yeah, I would say things started turning for us. I mean, we had we spent a lot of that time thinking about how this should work and yeah. formulating a lot of ideas. You know, we had plenty of that time. And I would say in 2008, we managed to meet uh, a woman named Sunny Bates, who's sure. The most connected woman in New York. Incredible recruiter. Incredible recruiter. Yeah. She shared, uh, she lived in the apartment building of one of a friend of Perry's from college who was huh. an, an early investor. So he was like, you should meet this woman. Yeah. Uh, we She's did. She's a force. She's a force. We were, she took us under her wing and, and introduced us to people. Um, and then we were able to start realizing the things that we didn't know that we needed to know. Got it. Um, and then finally, April 28th, 2009, the site launched. There was no big launch or anything, there's just a web page where there hadn't been one yeah. before. Um, and to get it started, we just gave our friends a couple invites, you know, just create projects, and that was it. And so we started it took off. off. Yeah, it took off. Not immediately, but, you know, it, it built pretty steadily. What were the size of the projects back then, and what, were the, what was the nature of the project? The very first project was to build an, uh, a Wikipedia app uh, that was trying to raise $100. A hundred dollars for a Wikipedia app. Yeah, to build a Wikipedia app, basically to pay the Apple, you know, the Apple feed, whatever, from putting your ah, application in. Uh, that was the first project to raise this funding. The second one was a thirty-five dollar project for a guy who just wanted to draw pictures for people. Hmm. Very, very simple. Um, the first project that really said to us this could be something important or this could really could work was by a woman named Allison Weiss, who is a singer-songwriter from Athens, Georgia, and she basically created this video where she talks through all the reasons why you should support her project. And they ah. were like, you like me. You know, I promise it won't suck. And right. all these things, it's just very honest. Was that the first video? Um, there, <laughs> there have been other videos, but that, was, that one created the template that people still use now. And ah. that launched the second week of Kickstarter. And the project went up. She's trying to raise two grand, and she gave herself 60 days to do it. And within uh, eight hours, she'd raised the full amount. We'd never wow. seen anything like that before. But she had a mailing list. She had a mailing list. She, she was an established person on Tumblr and just on the internet. And, and before that point, you know, all of our project widgets, when they show percent funded, maxed out at 100% because we thought, right. well, why would we need to show over 100%? Right. And suddenly she was 200% funded within like a couple days. And you're like, why not? Well, have got to show that now. Yeah, yeah, show that. Make a double yeah. album. So she, we really learned a lot from her, and, mm. and so did the rest of our community. So I think that project was one that was really important. Right. Another one was um, by Andy Bayo, uh, who... Yeah. Is, is an advisor to us and was part of our team. Um, he did one uh, that was an 8-bit chiptune cover of Miles Davis, Kind of Blue. That was wow. like a, a nice internet-y kind of project. That sure, sure, sure. Um, and we had, you know, just blips like that of, of people doing really interesting things that spread the word just a little bit. Um, and what we found at that time was that, you know, when someone starts a project, the first thing they do is they tell their friends, and within their friends, there are five other people who have things they want to do. So it's viral by design. 
by, by design and by luck. I mean, I, I, don't, I think we'd hope that it would work that way. You can't count on something like that. Well, I mean, if you're bringing in artists who do curate a mailing list, do have social media, they're going to bring something to the table. This is true. Um, and would this idea have worked prior to social media, prior to Twitter and Facebook, do you think? Um, I don't know. I mean, we were gambling on it. When we, when we were starting in 05, there wasn't Twitter. There wasn't, I don't know if Facebook was around. We didn't no, know about not it. not for you. Not it wasn't for, really not YouTube. For, not for non-EDUs. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm not sure how we expected word to get out in those pre-social media days, but obviously it's, it's hugely important to us now. Yeah. It's the backbone of a lot of what happens. Um, the, the site now is doing uh, a large number of projects at a very large pace. Yes. Uh, what is the largest project uh, ever done on the platform? Um, so the largest project in terms of funding was a, a project by a designer named Scott Wilson. Um, he's a really reputable guy. He designed the Xbox Connect, which has been a, a huge hit. And, yeah. And, uh, and he had designed this wrist, 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 wristband to turn an iPod Nano into a watch. Yes. And, uh, and Beautiful. He had, project. It's, very, it's a very simple thing. And he had gone to the companies you would expect someone like that to go to to try to get this made officially, and yeah. people weren't into it. They the thought, people who make those third-party like, you know, things you see in the iPad store. Exactly. And, iPod case companies. And they thought, they thought his price point was too high. They didn't think that people would be interested in this. Uh -huh. And he got a lot of pushback. So he, the gatekeepers said no. They said no. So he came to Kickstarter looking to raise 15 grand, and uh, he wasn't sure that he could do it. I mean, talking to him after the project went up, he was not sure if he could make that goal. Mm -hmm. um, but in a month, it ended up raising close to a million dollars to raise $945,000. What, what happens to that $900,000? Is $900,000 more than he needs? Yes. Is that just become pure profit to him, or does he kick it back into the project? Well, he has to make more watches. He has to make more wristbands. So his uh, margins certainly get better because uh, he's it. making more of these things. But it's got not it. like that's just So the crazy. contribution I make as an individual is to get the watch. You're buying the watch. So in a way, that's not like getting credit on the album cover or no. making a donation. That's actually pre-ordering a product. It's straight commerce. Straight commerce. It's straight commerce. But it's demand side commerce. Like I have to hit the certain benchmark. Yeah, he's saying he's saying if I get the fifteen grand is enough to, to do an order of whatever five hundred watches, and at that point, then then this thing can happen. And so in this case, it ends up there. Just the internet fell in love with it, and, and it went crazy. Uh, in every business that's successful like this, there's typically somebody who loses. In this case, the middleman who would have bought this from him or bought the rights to it for. 10k or 20k and giving them a dollar per wristband, they lost out on one of the most amazing products that could be in the Apple Store. Well, what's funny is that as of a month ago, it, it appeared in the Apple Store. Oh. Um, so even though he went this other way and he did right. this, he did it differently. He was but the case logic people didn't get. He this went direct to the store, I guess. But the other thing he got is he got a story. So now this, uh, you know, now it's not just a wristband. Whenever you're wearing the watch and someone asks you about it, that's a story you can tell. Like this is, you are part of this. You have right. bragging rights how, on this. How much is, of that is the dynamic? Do people want to be part of creation? I think that's a, a huge, huge piece of it. Um, you know, what happens when I back a project is that I get some sort of moral or, or spiritual or whatever sort of ownership of this. I get, yeah. I get to say that I was a part of this thing from the very beginning, and I think that there's a social capital that comes from that. Uh -huh. And I think that's kind of the most important thing, because you get that special, that special feeling, that warm glow. Yeah. And I, I think it's close to what you get from going to a farmer's market, for instance, and you, you, know, you meet the guy who grew the, who, who's raising the goat whose cheese you're buying. Yeah. And you have that, that closer connection, I think, that, that gives you a greater sensation uh, around something. And so what's happening on Kickstarter is this on a, on a macro level. So a, a really good example is um, one of my favorite projects was a, one of our very first ones. It was by this woman named Emily Richmond. And as part of an art project, she's sailing around the world alone. It's going to take her two years to do it. And so one of her rewards was for $15 on her trip, she would take a Polaroid. And then whenever she got to port, she would mail it to you. Wow. And so in that is just pure romance. You know, yeah. there's a story in that. Like you get that Polaroid and that says something and like you're part of that trip now. Wow. And uh, I told that story a lot during the first year of Kickstarter and about three or four months ago, I got an envelope in the mail that was, you know, beat to hell, had weird stamps on it. I open it up and there's a folded up map and I unfold it and sitting inside is this faded Polaroid and the foreground is a jungle. Then you see the beach, a white beach, and then you see the ocean in the background. Wow. And on the map, she's drawn. She circled where she is in the South Pacific, where the picture was taken. On the flip side, she wrote a letter describing what it, where it was, like wow. the monkeys in the trees behind her. For her 15 bucks, like, you have a piece of art 
that you can frame yes. that could become worth $15,000 someday. I'm going well, to keep it in my dresser mirror for the rest of my life. I mean, right. I think it's very romantic. And yeah. I'm not courageous enough to do this, but yet I get to have, feel like I'm a part of this in some right. way. And so, you know, it's that way whether you're a band making your first record or a filmmaker. You know, if you imagine you back a film and the film goes on to be in theaters and you're walking down the street and you see that poster and you're with yeah. a date, like you're grabbing their arm and saying, wow. you know, we're a part of this. Yeah. You know, and I think that that is ultimately the most important thing. And, and for that creator, you know, you, ha you know you have an audience that has a really deep investment in you and not a financial investment because we don't allow that at all, but an emotional investment. Like right. that's a true believer. That's someone that showed a lot of faith in you at a very early moment in your in your. And the reason it's not a financial investment is because? Well, um, you know, we were really not interested in that from the beginning. We, I can't remember if we knew that it was illegal or not, but, but we thought if you have people coming on and trying to back things because there'll be a hit, then you're just recreating the same mouse cage that we have now. Where ah. people are backing things based on a speculative nature. Will this make money? Will I get something in return from this? Right. And you know, from the very beginning of Kickstarter, what, one of the things that we really thought a lot about was just that most ideas are just ideas. It's, it's a thing in your head you want to have exist yeah. in the real world. If you make some money off of it, cool. But ultimately, you just want to make this thing. And instead, what we do is we shoehorn in monetization, all these kinds of things, because we're trying to answer what we think someone else is expecting. Mm -hmm. and, but yet, just that idea for idea's sake, there's not a lot of space for that if you're trying to get money. And so we thought if you make something where instead it's about just the joy of creation, about the relationship with that person. You watch right. the video, you think they're funny or cute or whatever. There's someone you know, you right. like the craft, all these things. These are things that we as an audience care about, but that the boardrooms do not. Mm -hmm. And so if you make it about, like, am I going to get a check, a royalty check for 37 you cents take or two years? Out of it. You really do. It just completely yeah. contorts what So with the woman who's going around the world, if it's $15 and you get some upside, if it becomes a movie with Tom Hanks and yeah, whoever I don't need it, that. That's not really the goal. No, I don't need also that. also happens to be illegal. Um, but other people now are looking at this crowdfunding and saying, aha, yeah. maybe there is something here. And in Europe, I understand there are some uh, imitators to what you're doing who are actually including equity. Yeah. Who are they? What are they doing? What do you think of it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that, that's not new. tracking it that deeply. That's huh? news to me. Uh, I mean, I know that I there are... I just got pitched on it. I can't remember the name. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, somebody in Europe is like, we're Kickstarter, but you get equity. And I was like, that's illegal. And they're like, not in Europe. I guess in some places in the world. Not yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense. But, um, but you, you have no interest no, in that. No, I mean, even if, even if whatever, this law in the U.S. got overturned, that would not change anything about yes. how, we, how we work. Uh, and so uh, at some point, uh, Fred Wilson and the team over at Union Square, Brad Burnham and uh, the team decide yeah. that they're going to bless you, the, the kings of New York venture capital, write you a check. How did that happen? I know Sonny knows Fred very well. Yeah, the answer is always Sonny for everything. All things it's, back to Sonny. It's always Sonny. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously we were great admirers of, of Union Square and of Fred yeah. and read his blog and we were just fans yeah. like anybody else. Um, and that was 90% of what you knew about him was his blog. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And uh, and yeah, through Sonny, we, we got an intro and, and, you know, started telling about what we were doing. And um, I mean, they... They really understood it. You know, I think that for people who are in more of a business-oriented realm, our ideas sounded crazily utopian, uh, really impractical, and you know, like who cares about starving artists? I think was some of the mindset. Yeah. Like, you know, who cares? Um, but I, I don't know. They they just they really understood it, and uh, and and they liked it from the beginning. And yeah. So how do you guys make money? I mean, if a VC is investing, obviously they're investing to have a. Uh, in their mind, a 50, 100 times return. Sure. They invested $10 million or something like that. I, I don't know if the number is public or not. Uh, that was reported, but, it's not, okay. but so it's not accurate. But Not accurate, but so some millions of dollars have been invested in the business. Some million, tens of millions have to come out. How is it that you guys make money? So if a project is successful, so all of our funding is all or nothing, but if a project is successful. What does that mean, all or nothing? Um, so when you create a project, you set a funding goal and a deadline by which you have mm -hmm. to reach it. Uh, if, when you hit your deadline, you've met your goal or surpassed it, then everyone's credit cards are charged and you get your cash. Uh, if you come up even a dollar short, everyone walks away like nothing happened. So I give my credit card and you just hold it in credit card escrow? I've never heard of that before. No, it, just, it goes through Amazon and basically you know, we record your number, take down your, you know, create a token for the payment and only charge it at, at a later point.
point. And I guess Amazon allows that. Yeah, it uses their flexible payment system. Ah. Is that something unique to Amazon's payment system? I'm, that sort of like charge if X happens, then yeah, Y charge can happen. It's definitely not. It's definitely not a usual thing. I'm not sure who else who else might do that. Um, so but it's built into their payment system. So so if we have um, so if a project makes its goal, we take five percent of the total amount that they raise. Very reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we we picked that because it was a round number because it was low. It also um, happens to be what investment bankers get when they do a transaction raising money for somebody. Seems reasonable to me. I mean. Yeah. It seems like you could take 20% or 10%. Why didn't you pick a higher number? Um, well, other, other sites have. I mean, I think more typically yeah. people go for a higher number, but we just we thought this seemed fair. Is that, what are the other ones doing? What type of number? I don't know. I mean, I think it varies, but I mean, we're certainly at the, at the yeah. low end of this thing. But we, you know, it's, it's a number that allows us to, to be a sustainable business. $60 million have been pledged so far as a number? That's right. $60 million. How many projects to date? Uh, 24,000. Twenty-four thousand dollars. I'm not very good at math, but what does the average project raise? Uh, the average, the average successful project raises about five grand, something like that. Okay. Um, so you know, reasonable amount of money. A lot of money, in fact. If you're doing an album or something, it seems yeah, like absolutely. more than enough. If you think about it as actual cash, five thousand yeah. dollars is a lot of money. But you know, yeah. we've had about uh, probably about twenty projects raise over a hundred thousand wow. um, dollars. Dysphoria was one, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Diaspora was the Diaspora, first. Rather. Diaspora was the was the first big. I mean, we've had we've had a lot of first big projects. The yeah. first one was um, called Designing Obama, which was by the, the design director of the Obama campaign, turning the campaign's imagery into a book. And that raised 85 grand. And for the first wow. year, it was like, that was 85 grand, the next closest was 20. You know, really, right. you know, so just you keep having out. these high water marks. You keep having the South by South, mo South by Southwest moment. It keeps happening at yeah. Kickstarter. Yeah, they're just these blockbusters. And then Diaspora, uh, happened in I guess that was last March and it raised two hundred thousand. And they put in originally for ten or twenty. For ten, and there was uh, that was funny. The the, the main guy was a, a guy named Max and and a really nice group of group of kids. They're all NYU students. Three of them were freshmen yep. at NYU at the time. And uh, and the day their project was on the front page of the New York Times and it just went crazy. They raised ninety grand in a single day because it was during the Facebook privacy stuff yeah, and people all that. Said, I want a open source now, private social network. That project hasn't really gone that well. Well, it, it hasn't broken out. It, how does that reflect on Kickstarter then? And how much of that is a concern for you of if the money is raised and it doesn't actually succeed or it's not a good album? Yeah. Uh, well, in the case of Diaspora, they did fulfill all their promises, the deadline they said. They said yeah. they'd deliver source code by October and all that, and they did. Yeah. And they've been in alpha. Um, so stating what will be delivered for the money is critical, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we require that every project offer rewards. So it's not just a PayPal button or donation mm -hmm. platform. You know, you're always getting something in return. Right. Um, but you know, with the, with the Diaspora guy, just, just the day that it went crazy, I happened to have a phone conversation with him, with, with the yeah. main guy, Max. And, and he was saying that, um, he was graduating from NYU that day, and the night before, his parents had told him that he needed to stop wasting time with this diaspora thing and focus on getting a real job and all that. Yeah, go work for Facebook. Go, go work at a real job, and the next morning, he's on the front page of the New York Times, and, and Hello. just goes crazy. So it's a really incredibly powerful and enabling story. But so back to the issue of it's a dud, yeah, or fraud occurs, yeah. God forbid. Yeah. Um, how do you keep fraud out of the system? Well, the interesting thing is that when or I or failure, sure. I mean, there's a few different things. I mean, there's one that just things don't turn out as, as good as people thought. And I think that's something very different. Like, sure. we understand that art is unpredictable yeah. and, and whatever. But you've had um, that happen. What happens in that case? In that case, you know, if backers are unhappy with, with what came out of it, they can complain to the, you know, to the creator or whatever. But we but haven't do you get had... complaints ever? Do you get people say, like, oh, my God, I, I put it to this album and the album sucked? Uh, no, no, no not, nothing like that. Nothing like that. Um, you know, the interesting thing is that when you, when you launch a project, the majority of your backers are going to be your audience and your right. network. And so those, there's an honor system that you have with those Social people. Social pressure, sure. Exactly. So if you burn every fan you've ever, you've ever made, every friend that you it's have, on you. there are bigger problems in your life than just Kickstarter. Right. Kickstarter and, is the enabling platform. Exactly. So we think that, that, that those social forces are a really strong motivator to keep people you know, accountable. Right. Um, you know, if things really go off the rails, uh, you know, backers can institute chargebacks and you know, they can take action in that way. Right. But today that we have That has to have happened, right? Uh, you see chargebacks occasionally, mm -hmm. um, but we haven't had any sort of big problem so today. People can say, I, di I didn't like the result, I'm charging back. Yeah. And then it comes out of that person's account, yeah. not Kickstarter's. Correct. So you have a pretty good, as a platform,
pretty good protection that you're you're not actually creating the project, you're not fulfilling the thing, you're a platform. Right. In a way, you're like the payment system. That like there's a certain sure. I mean, process. it's like it's like eBay or you know or Etsy. I mean, they all function yeah. in a similar kind of model. But why is the quality so high? Do you, do you guys nobody can just post anything, right? You, how many projects do you turn down for everyone you accept? So we so we do have a, a filter. Um, so to create a project, we ask that you write in and tell us what you want to do. So right. we ask. To tell us what you're going to do, tell us something about you, tell us what people are going to get in exchange. Yeah. Um, we get about 2,000 of those a week that people wow. write in, and we write back to each one individually. I got written back. That was pretty cool. Yeah, we talked. We yeah. talked with your project. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was the only person who wrote back to people for the first year. Now, fortunately, we have a team. So of you have eight to people. break people's heart nine out of ten times, I'm taking Unfortunately, it? we have a portion of our staff who will be really good with breaking up with boyfriends or girlfriends it's for the not rest of their lives. You, it's me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is that basically what you say? No. I mean, the reasons why we turn things down are pretty clear. Um, we, we require that everything be a project, so a finite thing with a beginning and an end. So not just an open-ended fundraising Don't pay idea. my rent. I'm going to build this series of photography. Yes. Yeah. So no fund my life, uh, no charity or cause-based projects. It all has to be creative oh. in nature. Um, and so those are the primary reasons why we say no. Um, but we accept 60% of what comes our way, 40% we say no to. I think to date we've probably gotten about, I don't know, about probably about 120,000 proposals in wow. a lifetime. So five out of six don't get into the system. Uh, no, 60% are accepted. Oh, 60% are accepted. Yeah. Ah. That's a very high rate. It is. We've, and we've, we've become more open over time. I think at the beginning, if you're not sure how else this is going to go, you want to you really want to shape this and mold this into what you want it to be. And then over time, you just realize that this is not just our site. There's a broader community here, and you just become more used to, to what people, you make it on. Uh, the question I really want to get you to answer is, do people, and don't answer it yet, but um, do people go to Kickstarter looking for a project to fund, or is most of the, at this point, has it turned that corner? Because that seems to be the significant, yeah. that will be the significant moment for me. When people go to Kickstarter and say, I'm just looking for something interesting to support, as opposed to, I got here because my friend emailed me and begged me to support their project. Um, and speaking of supporting projects, uh, GoToMeeting is the easiest way to hold unlimited meetings for one flat fee. A decent segue, perhaps. <laughs> okay? Everybody looked at me and they were like, mm, not one of your best segues, but okay. Uh, GoToMeeting uh, we use for the producer's program. I use it every week when I'm doing angel investing calls. Etc. Collaborate with remote colleagues by attending meetings from your computer or your iPad now. That's amazing. Go ahead and go to gotomeeting.com and use the promo code START for a 30-day free trial. Again, all of the advertisers on the show, we really call them partners, are here because I've whitelisted them because I use the product. I was like, hey, we use GoToMeeting every, almost every day in the office, every other day. Um, this would be a great sponsor. Let's get them in here. And uh, sure enough, they said yes, and they're having a great result because you guys are smart enough to know what's a good product. Go ahead and bank at GoToMeeting on your Twitter account. They love to hear that. And if you want to get a free This Week in Startups bag, spend any kind of money with GoToMeeting and send us the uh, receipt at contest at thisweekend.com, and we will send you a This Week in Startups bag. Thank you. Thank you so much, GoToMeeting, for making independent media like this possible. So before we went to our sponsor break yes, sir. to pay the bills, we were talking about uh, people joining Kickstarter, uh, and coming direct and saying, right. I want to fund something. Are people doing that now? Are, are patrons coming just browsing and saying, screw it, I want to just put $100 towards something, let me find something? Yes. Um, so we've had s over 700,000 people have backed a project now. Uh, 700,000 700, people. people. Uh, and 100,000 people have backed more than one. And so we oh. see that repeat backers being the sign of maybe you came for your, your friend's project, but then you found something else that you liked. Right. And so those 100,000 100, backers, their pledges uh, make up 27% uh, of all the money pledged on Kickstarter so far. Ah, so there are super users in there. There are huge super users. I think our most prolific backer has backed 600 projects. 600? I backed 400, and I'm third right now. Uh, so you there is a little bit of a competition to see how many of these things for you can me. Do. I mean, we don't we don't really display but the number. This could be as a dollar or two dollars or ten dollars. The guy the guy who's back six hundred projects every day he backs a different project for a dollar, and he does it because oh. he wants to be involved in the story. He likes the person getting emails saying that he's supporting them, mm. uh, and I, we like that. We think it's a nice way. Can to Can it be any it. dollar amount? Can you support for any dollar amount? Is that a, regu a regulation or a, a it's guide? It's from one dollar to ten thousand dollars. Ah, so you you cap the amount somebody can yes. put in. Why? Um, I think it's an Amazon restriction, but it, it ah. feels like a good number. Yeah. Yeah. For an art project, 10,000 seems like a pretty... How is this impacting different industries? Art, music, film, where are you having design, obviously? 
Where are you having the biggest impact, would you say? Um, the biggest impact is film. Um, really? Yeah, film projects so far have raised $25 million. And over 2,700 films have been funded. $25 million. $25 million to film. Within that, within that, even break it down, $10 million to documentaries. $5 million to short films, which is just a market that never existed before. Yeah, shorts are the, yeah. A million dollars to web series, which would probably be of interest wow. to you. Wow, um, yeah. And, and so film has just been enormous. And this past weekend I was at uh, the Sheffield Doc Fest, which is the largest international documentary festival, and they had a slate of about 60 films playing. I think eight or nine of them were Kickstarter funded. We mm -hmm. had six films premiere at Sundance this past year. You, know, the, you had six films at Sundance? Yes. And, so, and the company's only two years old, and yes. Sundance is a year in advance. How many do you think you'll have five years from now? I have no idea. We had we had a uh, best Oscar nominee for best short documentary this past year. Oh really? Year as Which well. one? It's called Sun Come Up. It was a short doc about Ireland's disappearing to global warming. So um, do you think that this is new activity or the fundraising process has just moved online? Well, it's it's different. I mean, I, what I've what I've realized, what I didn't know about film before starting this, is that to be a filmmaker is to be a permanent fundraiser. Oh yes. Uh, and I, I hadn't realized that was part of it. I like to think that filmmakers were in some castle examining different lenses for like 16 hours a day. But yeah. I realize now they're having dinner with oil barons to try to get them to write Absolutely. them a check for 100 grand. Sure. Um, so they were just, a, I think, well attuned to this. And by oil barons, you mean dot com executives who are retired, <laughs> sure, who want to who want to cast their daughter in the second lead. Um, Larry Ellison. <laughs> uh, but you know what's funny is. That that it goes beyond film. So yeah. just to give you an idea of other categories, the film is 25 million, music is 15 million. Um, within music, classical music has raised about $700,000. Wow. Um, so those are, what you're seeing there is probably underservice demographics yes. Yes. are becoming the ones that get the most traction. Yes. So theater has our highest success rate on the site, like 67% of theater projects succeed. Wow. Theater has raised three and a half million dollars. Theater. Theater. Dance. Theater. Yeah, modern dance, $800,000. Comics, over a million dollars. Comics, a million dollars. There's an article in, in Publishers Weekly this past week that said that Kickstarter was now the third largest indie comics publisher in the United States, just based on the number of projects being successfully funded each month. Amazing. There, is there something fundamentally changing? I'm, I'm so glad that you came to on the program because I'm so inspired by what you're doing. Uh, it fascinates me. Is there something fundamentally changing in consumption that, where people are saying, I... I don't like the prepackaged stuff. Yeah. I want the well. Actually, it is prepackaged in a way. I just want to. I don't want to consume what is being given to me by the big machine. It's not that satisfying, right? I mean, you go you go to Walmart, you go to whatever, you buy the thing off the shelf, yeah. and you look around. There are thousands of people doing the exact same thing. Like, what right. does that say about you? You know, it, it's not very meaningful. It doesn't have that resonance. Right. And so, I think this is different. And I think that. With the web the way it is, where we're all broadcasting and talking, and, and, and you know, it's nice to have things of our own, you know, and this becomes part of your identity to be a part of these things, and mm -hmm. how early you were, and you know, being a trend spotter. All these things, I think, are just basic human instincts. Yeah. So I think I think what's interesting about us is is that one of the reasons why it's worked is that we're not trying to make people do something they don't already want to do. It's just that it's been too hard to support things or be a part of something. It's, yeah, you're there's a been catalyst. too much friction. Yeah, you're exactly. We're just like, here's a door here where you can do a lot. Of, there's just opportunity here for both backers and creators. Opportunity to do things, to experience things, whatever. Check it out. And that's all it is. In a way, it's a triumph over the lowest common denominator, mashed potatoes, garbage, that's being fed to us. People, there was always this concern that, my God, movies are just spiraling out of control and yeah. they're just going to be sequels, Based upon some, you know, uh, studio executive running some numbers in the marketing and the trailer, and everything's going to be Adam Sandler with a bunch of penguins or who the yeah. hell knows what. Yeah. But here, you're unlocking this sort of magical part that we, we actually don't want. That the human right. spirit is revolting against the machine. Well, what we want as an audience is very different than what a studio wants as a business. Like right. we're thinking about very different qualities, and so that's not to say everything that gets made here is amazing or that it, you know that. That it's that, but what it is, it's a more honest reflection of what audiences want. And you know, in, in film, we're seeing more and more reputable people come and use the site. I mean, we would be totally cool if the most famous person to ever use Kickstarter has already used it. We're not yeah. chasing celebrity in that kind of way. But in the last few months, we had Matthew Modine launch a project to turn a Matthew, diary yeah. he kept yeah, during the, Full Metal Jacket into course, an app. Of course, yes, the silver, the, the silver yes, book. So he turned it into book, an yeah. iPad app. Um, Colin, oh, he made it into an, an iPad app. Yeah, that was his Kickstarter project. Wow. How much did he raise? He raised $25,000. Oh, so awesome. And he yeah. did that because Matthew is an interesting guy. Yeah, he liked the idea. Liked his $10,000 $10, 10, reward was uh, you got to go to his house, watch Full Metal Jacket with him, and have dinner. 
Yeah. Which I'm sure a very weird peer person shows that reward. Absolutely. Um, but uh, Colin Hanks launched uh-huh. a project last week to make a documentary about Tower Records, Tom, Tom Hanks' son. We wow. had uh, the Duplass brothers who made Cyrus and are great mumblecore directors who are they're very reputable in that world. They've each done projects. Um, uh, Spencer Tunick, who does these large scale. Sure, Spencer Tunick does all the naked. Yeah, uh, so he shoots. raised one hundred and twenty thousand dollars to do a shoot in the Red Sea. Wow! Um, and so all these people, you know, they're, they're slowly coming here. So now the legends are coming. Yeah, that's going to be the next South by Southwest moment. It's it's interesting because they're coming here. Not sometimes these people have the money. Colin Hanks, I'm sure, is good for the fifty grand he's, he's yeah. raised so far. But here he's building an audience. And he's ah. promoting this idea. And basically, you're able to generate an audience from the moment of inception of the idea. Hmm. You know, you're not having to wait till that moment to do your P&A and your marketing. You know, you're really getting people engaged from the very beginning. So in a way, it's, it's super fan building while funding. It's Kevin Kelly's thousand true fans just from the beginning. You know, and you know who they are. You know who they are from the very beginning. So you guys are first-time entrepreneurs. We are. Um, what has been the hardest part about being a first-time entrepreneur for you? Um, this is the part of the show where you have to be really honest, and I may lean over to cry. <laughs> yeah, and say yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, this is the Oprah moment. I'm not sure. I mean, I think that getting this off the ground was was very, very hard. Um, we made a lot of mistakes, and uh, we didn't know what we were doing. And but what I, were the mistakes? What were the mistakes? I mean, I, I mean, the, on, on a blocking and tackling level, what did you f up? Uh, the biggest was thinking that we could have outside developers rather than having uh, developers send in-house. it to Europe and and we send it to Manila. We we would meet with people who would tell us that will never work, and in our heads we'd be like, whatever, old man, you know, yes. we'll we'll show you. And, and it we, didn't work. It didn't work. Why didn't it work? It's just hard because your interests aren't aligned. You know, if you're paying someone by the hour, or whatever, they're not in the same room with you, living and breathing this thing. You just have a different so it's a management issue. Yeah, like managing think, the relationship and it's just hmm. hard. It just it just makes it very difficult. So now you got some developers here. So then we managed to, to find some really good people to work with and, and you know that, that really turned the tide. But you know, for us, you know, running the company, um, I mean this is the longest Perry has ever had a job. It's the first office job Perry has ever had in his life. Um, but Perry is just a really sharp guy, really good thinker, like a, just really, really great at vision and just and thinking hard about what we're doing. I have more experience with, with sort of managing people, managing teams, and I've, right. I've had actual office jobs before. Um, so for us, you know, each day w- you kind of make it up, I guess, as you go along. You're not really yeah. sure, but we have strong instincts about what's right or what's wrong. And, and for me, I've worked at jobs in the past that I haven't liked, and you learn a lot from those jobs. You say, if I ever had my, my turn, yeah. I, I'd know what I would do differently. Ah. And, and so, what's the number one thing that you do differently as a boss? I mean, what is your style that you didn't see at those other big companies? I don't companies? know. I mean, we, we sit, our office is not far from here on the Lower East Side, and we, we're in a small tenement building. We sit in a, a very small room, 24 people. Um, open office plan. Open, open office. There are no doors. No uh, hiding. No hiding of anything. No we're secrets. Just, yeah, no secrets whatsoever. I think, I think that's really important. I also think that we've been, we've been fortunate that this has been successful and that we're not having to chase revenue and things like that where we can make decisions based on our values mm-hmm. and like our moral compass rather than the dollar. And typically that's where people start to compromise and sure make decisions is. that they're not wild about. And we haven't had to do that. Um, funding is a good thing. Funding is a good thing. It gives you, it gives you space to think right. and, and take your time with this. And I think the other thing that really helped us is having that, that four years before launching um, to really beat up the idea a lot and beat up a lot of our assumptions and really question a lot of things. And, we kind of we stripped down the idea to just a very simple thing because we thought you know, people can only take one new concept at a time. Let's not confuse people. Let's put out just the essence of what we think Kickstarter is. Yeah. If that works, then cool, we got it. You know, if it doesn't, then you and know, work oh, it well. has two million dollars a week going through the system. Two million dollars a week right now. I'm, I'm not an expert on math, but I think that's a hundred four million dollars a year, which at five percent means it's a five million dollar business already. Yeah, it's that's going pretty right. extraordinary. Um, and the and the growth curve phenomenal. Yeah. A year ago, how much were you doing a week? Uh, a year ago, we we're probably doing uh, about five hundred thousand dollars, four hundred thousand dollars, something wow. like that. So it's grown five x in a year. Yeah. The run rate. Yeah. We did a we did a for our birthday was two year birthday was uh, about a month ago, six weeks ago, and for that we opened up our entire dashboard and gave every stat that we had from our first two years. Hmm. Um, so people are curious and good at. Just Google "Happy Birthday Kickstarter" and it will pop up. But we, you know, we're proud of, of what we've been able to do, and, and I think that, you know, people see the individual stories of, you know, 
Janie makes an art project yeah. or whatever, and it's easy to think, well, that's great for her, but really this is, you know, how big can this be? But to show just the scale of this and, and how deeply people are, are just, you know, investing themselves in this uh, is really exciting. So, you know, the number of products launch every month, all those just, you know, shooting up. Yeah. Um, and so How for, big can it get? I mean, is this going to be, is it going to be, you know, $10 million a week going through this? $100 million a I week? Have, yeah, I have no idea. I have no idea. I mean, I, I don't, I'm it's not sure. It's not slowing down. It's speeding up. It is. It is. And we're just in the U.S. right now as well, so we'll have to expand internationally. So there, there's that right. to think about. So too. there's Europe. Right. Is, well, Europeans, I guess, could be doing it in English, I guess. But you could be doing it in Japan or China or South yeah. America. Yeah. I mean, all these. Uh, have people knocked off the idea yet in China and Japan? Ev everywhere. I mean, everywhere. There's, there's probably about frustrating as an entrepreneur. Some some days depends on my mood. Um, there's about 75 copycats right now. 75. Uh, something like that around wow. the, around the world. And there were only two of you in the beginning, Indiegogo and you, right? Uh, yeah, there's Fundable, there's Celeband. Celeband. Uh, so some people have done it in verticals. The idea yeah. was out there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. But nobody's taken it to this level yet. Yeah. Is it going to go down to the mom and pop like uh, my daughter's? You know, doing a play with her friends for have, five thousand dollars. Yeah, we have some of those now. We have community theater. So you're things, not like, like that. snobs about it. It has to be a hipster thing. No, not at all. Not at you all. You don't mind if it's a thousand dollar project for my kids' play? We love those. Uh, we love the small projects. I think that they're, I don't know, they're easy to relate to. And yeah. you know, it's our belief that any two friends could get together for a weekend and, and hack together a project, which is yeah. something they want to do. Uh, I had a project actually that just ended today, um, where I just. The entire project is a, a T-shirt that has the finished stats of the project itself on it. So it ended with 536 backers and $8,000 raised. So 500 people will get that same T-shirt. We're all on, we're all in the club together. But it's wow. just it's just a goofy meta project and things like that. That is pretty are, meta. That is pretty meta. Uh, but I'm going to do a project um, that is a collection of the projects there you of go. the meta projects mm -hmm. on Kickstarter. Yeah, it's my. It's going to be a meta project dashboard. It's my second meta project, actually. Is it really? Yeah, my first oh, one. Okay. So Perry and I did one at the very beginning with a friend of ours, Claudia, um, where we found that through Blurb you could print a book. A hundred page book was thirty dollars. So uh, we thought, pay thirty dollars, you get a page in the book to put whatever you want on it, and then you get a copy of the book itself. It's a hundred page book with a hundred authors, and we had a party here in New York. Uh, where everyone came and you got a name tag with your page number on it and everyone signed each other's books like a yearbook thing and that was it. So That's it was pretty meta. Pretty meta. So uh, final question. Advice for people who see the show and want to get their project approved. Top couple of things they can do to make sure that it's worthy of not only being approved but getting on the front page. Because sure. it seems like there's a dozen or two projects on the front page. How do they make something that's so worthy it gets there? Well, I think that the, the ways to, to make your project succeed are yeah. you have to have a video. We're a very video-driven site. Mm. We, you know, most videos are a face of someone talking about what they're doing and, you know, and the connecting like that. So good lighting, Vimeo, HD. It even need to be, that stuff doesn't even matter. I think it just has to be you. Authentic. Authentic is what matters. Authentic video, number one. Uh, number two is you have to have good rewards. So offer things that people are going to want. This is pretty simple. Also pay what people, charge them what people would expect to pay. So don't charge the hundred dollar DVD or the two hundred dollar tote bag. Like don't ah, PBS so align style. the don't PBS up. Align pricing appropriately. Yeah. Give value for dollars. Exactly. Think about like look at these things and think what I pay for this. Right. And then the last thing I would say is that you have to you have to promote your project. You have to tell your story. So and be smart ah. about it. Don't just blast and spam. But like think hard about mm. how does he want to tell this because this is a, a real opportunity to have a lot of focus on you and, and what it is that you do. So you know I spend a lot of people telling. Spend a lot of time telling people, don't think about this like a business proposal, a PowerPoint. Like, think about what you most care about with this. Think about what's in your heart and, and tell that story because that's what other people are going to connect to ultimately. Uh, this has been an amazing interview. I have to say, it's like, you know, I meet a lot of entrepreneurs, I meet a lot of businesses. I cannot stop thinking about Kickstarter. It's an amazing project. I wish you a lot of success with it. I really think that this becomes a billion dollar company. I think it's it's got <laughs> eBay written all over it. And I know that. You know, as a music writer, maybe you're not you, you're not even thinking about that, and you, you probably don't care. But I think that you've created one of the most meaningful startups I've seen in 20 years. Continued success. Thank you very much for having me. It's awesome. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you to our sponsors. Um, we couldn't do it without you. Speaking of funding, um, at GoToMeeting, what a great product, and at Squarespace, another amazing product. Hey, thanks to our executive producers who, who came in. You can't see them, but they're here in the back. And I've been rolling around New York with the executive producers. It's such an amazing thing to have 75 new friends who
who are thinking about the show with me and thinking about how to make it better, uh, join the back channel, twistlist.co, um, for as little as 10 bucks a month. It's really, I mean, I, I can't even tell you the executive producer level, producer level, supporters, everybody sort of gets treated the same. Uh, although there are some benefits that are different, right? Right. So I think I'm kind sure, of learning. Sure, sure. I should just make a video. Tier it. Tier it yeah. I should tier it. Um, anyway, what an amazing episode. What an amazing trip to New York it's been. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing everybody Friday for the two-year anniversary of This Week in Startups. The Twisties are this Friday night. Don't miss it. We're going to be in tuxedos, and we're doing a musical number. That's, That's going to be pretty exciting, time. isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>